Yeah, who am I? First off, I'm Banjo Biami. I'm a senior research engineer at 2.6 Labs. We do a lot of cool artificial intelligence and machine learning and use DevOps practices to apply that. So, so when I talk of Dev ML Ops, it's a philosophy of integrating DevOps processes within the machine learning framework. So a typical machine learning framework pipeline contains of three distinct steps. First, you want to gather the data. So once you obtain data, you want to do some cleaning processes, make sure it fits your pipeline, get rid of outliers, and prepare that to train a model. The next step is actually training the model based on that data. Once the model is trained, you want to test it, evaluate it, and put it into like a production mode. So the third step is actually validating your model on real world data. And based on that, you want to evaluate how well your model predicts a new data coming in and evaluate that and start the process all over. In practice, a lot of machine learning researchers are from an academic world. So they're used to this working locally. Make sure the first thing works, it, it's ready to go, I works on my machine, great. Uh, next. But normally they only track what they care about. So if it, their use case works, it's good for their paper, they're trying to publish, that's all they're gonna track, they're gonna forget everything else. So it's hard to reproduce. Once the end product, usually an academic paper being published, they have all their data and results there, but it's not really reproducible for others to utilize or in a scalable fashion, because it was just for that one research project, one paper. So when we talk about DevOps, we want to merge the development, quality assurance, and the operations in a single continuous process. And when it comes to machine learning, we want to encapsulate that machine learning price slide into a single continuous set of processes. So we want to model the problem. Machine learning systems are a complex pipeline instead of just a single binary application. We want a robust way to reduce technical depth in each part of the pipeline. So from gathering data, from training the model, and producing that. And we want to make it repeatable so we can compare across multiple different runs. In DevOps, we use infrastructure as code to help facility pro processes similar to this. It brings visibility to this and state of configuration of what's going on in your DevOps pipeline. And it makes it autonomous. It gets rid of a lot of the manual steps that are used or error prone. And we want to get rid of that. We're also trying to create a machine learning pipeline in that. So some tools that help facilitate that in DevOps world are like Ansible. You configure everything in a configuration file called a playbook, and then you're able to just run it through the command line, run this playbook, and it does all these configuration steps that are set up. Terraform's another uh, for a tool that allows you to encapsulate all your resources and then deploy them in a continuous fashion at the same time, every way. And you can look at what's gonna be deployed, how it's gonna be deployed, and when it's deployed. And serverless is another tool that allows you to create uh, serverless functions so you don't have to worry about your code and all the infrastructure behind that is set up through serverless through its YAML file. So a lot of the common themes in these tools are command line driven. You can put them wherever you want. You have a lot of processes going. The command line interface allows it to be very plug and play and you can testify how you want to run these processes. They have a highly flexible configuration file. You can, there's so many variables and inputs you can put in these files so you can customize it to your use case. And it provides visibility. You know what's going to be run, how it's running, what's going on, because of the, the CLI nature and also the nice big configuration file that it has. So we want to bring this infrastructure's code approach to machine learning, because at the end of the day, nothing lasts. Okay. <laughs> so, some infrastructure kind of pipeline tools that I found to like help facilitate this process. Uh, uh, DVC is one of them. It's a data vision control. Similar to GitHub, it allows you to store data and utilize that and track the pipeline of how your data is going, how it's flowing in, and how it fits into your system. Uh, TensorFlow TFX, 
That's another uh, tool uh, using the TensorFlow pipeline that allows you to encapsulate all your machine learning processes into infrastructure's code. And then MLflow is another uh, CLI-driven tool that allows you to use configuration files to track how your machine learning pipeline is developed. So a lot of these tools, the goal is to prevent a snowflake environment by having a repeatable, scalable, and trackable pipeline. And when I say snowflake environment, I mean an environment you get to that you don't know how it got there. It's so unique, you don't want to destroy it because it's, it's your special snowflake, you don't, and it can't be reproduced. Well, we don't want to kind of have that situation when we're developing machine learning products. We, it could be critical system, they're developing stuff, you don't know how they got there, so it's very important to track how the machine learning models got into production. So to show how these tools work in practice, I'm gonna run through an example, uh, determining the quality of wine based on a set of features. Each of these tools have different strengths and weaknesses, so I'm gonna highlight some of them as I go through how a machine learning engineer would write a pipeline to do all these things with these tools. So the first step in the pipeline is data. So in this example, there are 12 different features, and then each of those uh, allows you to determine a quality so features like pH, exidery, how much alcohol content, and based on that, a quality is derived. So in DVC, we wanna use data management to see, okay, where did we get our data? In this example, we have a large CSV file that has all those features and a quality number. We're using that as our baseline in, uh, data pipeline. And DVC allows you to use Git-like commands, so like, adding this file, I can push it to a central repository and other people can grab that so you know where the data is in your pipeline. It gives it a, a unique hash so you know when the data was last uploaded, how, what the actual hash is, if something changed, it gives you that kind of modular way to see, okay, this is my data, I can push it and I can retrieve it. So DVC uses something called a DVC file, similar to like uh, a Git file that allows you to encapsulate what happens in each time you wanna go through a pipeline. So in this example, it's creating uh, a training pipeline using uh, to, to prepare. So when the data gets there, you wanna prepare what happens. So maybe get rid of outliers, uh, normalize some features if something's out of whack, if something has a null value, you don't want that in your training set. So DVC allows you to prepare what's gonna happen. Similarly, the training pipeline, it has a similar function. You can set a lot of command line interfaces you can put and it'll show you what happens when you wanna train. And also when you actually wanna create a model. So it allows the same kind of command line interface that allows you to input features and then get a result. And it has a nice way to see, uh, show what's actually happening. So by using the pipeline show command, it allows you to show what happens at each step of your training process. So you get the data, you want to prepare it, and then deploy it. Another tool, TFX, uh, uses TensorFlow to kind of encapsulate all this stuff in code. So the first one, the example generator in the TFX pipeline, it allows you to uh, ingest where your data is coming from, and when you're, where your data is, uh, you, it sets up the initial pipeline. So example generator allows you to generate examples of your data. So for example, in this wine example, it can give you a random set of, um, of rows in kind of that CVS file. The next one is a statistics generator. It allows you to see what happens, how your data is laid out. So what's the mean average of certain fields? What's the, uh, how many of this uh, field came? What's the most popular one? So it gives you knowledge about your data. Uh, yeah, so the next two fields about the, the schemas generation. So you know how your data is generated, uh, the, the schema of the actual data. And then from there you can see what is the, can't really see, but the train, yeah, you wanna kinda, it gives you a UI basically. So once you have your data, you have a schema for that data, and you can see a user interface of how your data is laid out so you can make better models and track what your data is doing. Uh, so to reiterate, uh, DVC has the CLI delivery process. It has a highly flexible configuration file and provides visibility through that pipeline command. And TensorFlow, FIAX, everything is done through Python in this example. 
and you can configure it because you're using code, and it gives a UI to have that visibility. And VPC is repeatable because it has those uh, the CLI commands. You can just keep running. It's scalable because it has that. By having those command lines, you can end up put them wherever you need to in your pipeline, and it's trackable through the pipeline command that shows you what's going on. And TFX is the similar way, but it has is that everything in, in codified in code. It uses Apache Beam under the hood to kind of scale that out if you need it to run the pipeline in multiple locations. And it's trackable through it has a UI command. So pretty much <laughs> I drink and know things. That's what it really comes down to about this data generation. You know all you, you know everything about your data before you go to the next step. So training is the next step, and it's pretty much an output a model of data that can predict the quality of wine based on the features. So in TFX, uh, we'll go on and put something through the training pipeline. So the code to do that pretty much splits up the training data from the example generator and uh, turn into a two set. So the first set is the training data. And then the next set is the evaluation process. So you're pretty much going to have create two different sets of data for a model to look at. And then when you want to test how good the data is, you evaluate that based on the, the evaluation set that's created. And the next step is to actually train the model. So by training the model, it's actually going to go through those training steps, try to determine which features are more important, and then it will test that based on the evaluation to see how close it was to those actual predictions. And the next steps of actually evaluating. So yeah, so making sure that, okay, we have a good loss. We didn't, this funk training model is pretty close to what we expect it to be. And we can probably want to put this in production now that we have something to baseline to compare against. And also provide the nice UI to see all the statistics of what's happening when you're training a model. And it can also be pushed to Kubeflow, which is a, Kubernetes-based uh, deployment fu function for machine learning models, and it's very simple. It comes, the base case comes with a Jupyter Notebook, which so basically allows you to run your code in a series of steps. So you can put your ent entire pipeline into this notebook, and it'll allow you to deploy it to a Kubernetes function. So MLflow, it's uh, similar to a lot of the other ones. It has a an um, ML project file that allows you to encapsulate what you want to do. So it gives you uh, a conda environment, which is basically like a Dockerized Python that allows you to know what actual things you need to run your project, and you can define what you want to uh, run when you run this pipeline. So I want to run a training function based on this data, and you can input variables to, to tweak and tune based on how you want to your model to perform. And you can inject this right in, directly into code to track what you want. So every time it's run, it's always going to make sure to track these ex exact variables. And you just run it through a simple command line argument, and it'll just run your entire pipeline. It also comes with a UI that allows you to see each of the, the steps that you had. And when you click in, you can see what was actually run, what the actual inputs were, where it was, what the outputs were, when it was run, and other information. So you always know how this experiment is run, how it got to this position, and you're not lost on how we're going to rep replicate that. It also has a CLI interface to see what all the runs that were run previously. And it allows you to go through and look at it in a, a text command through JSON by actually outputting the results of each run. It's also integrated with Databricks, which is a platform to run Apache Spark and at scale. So it's easy. You could just point your entire pipeline and point to a database cluster, then it allowed that to scale that out. So to reiterate, uh, MLflow has the CLI driven by just all those commands that it has. It has a flexible configuration file, and it's done through code, and it provides visibility to the UI and the CLI. And TFX is done through the code. It has a, you can carry everything through Python and provide the UI to see what's going on. Uh, MLflow is repeatable due to those of the C using the CLI and scalable through Databricks. It's also trackable through the UI and the CLI. And then TFX has the same UI, has the Python, everything is, and you can also use Kubeflow, which allows it to scale out.
<laughs> so basically, now that we know that, we know of everything about our data, and we want to know, OK, we know our data, what's going to happen. We think it's good, so let's put it in production. So the last step of the pipeline is serving the model. So we want to create an interface that can take the input of features and then infer the quality of the wine. So MLflow has three ways to deploy. It has a, a local way that allows, that sets up a flash server and an endpoint that you can throw things at. It also can build a container and push that to Azure ML and as well as AWS SageMaker. When I run it through SageMaker, it goes through putting the actual model, so everything that's trained, it puts that into an S3 bucket store, and then it puts the container in a Elastic Container Registry, so it's saved, you know when it was run, and all your stuff is there. And then through PhaseMaker, it creates an endpoint that hits that Docker container, so you can send curl commands to it to get back a results. One more bat. Right there, so, yeah. So I was saying that when you deploy the, to Amazon SageMaker or locally, and it gives you an endpoint that you can send like a curl command, and through this curl command, I'm sending 12 different features, and it gives me an, a quality of wine. So 3.6 based on all those features. So probably some low quality wine. Uh, I don't like a Merlot. It really depends what you like. but uh, And it gives you some visibility on what's happening. So it says how many times it's been invoked, how strong this is, how much CPU utilization is. So there's some base metric, but not enough to really dive in to like how your model is performing. TFX has this another similar way. It has something that can bless a model. So it's going to use this evaluator to see if your model is good enough to be pushed to production. And then the next feature is called the pusher. The pusher looks at that blessing to see, OK, my model was better than it was before, so let me actually deploy it. And then TFX Pusher allows you to push things natively to Google Cloud. And once it's there, you can see how your pipeline has gone, where, what the runs were, everything it took to get up to that production level place. So to iterate, a memo flow has the CLI that allows you to build the images and then sure, push sure, that. Sure. It has the conf uh, highly configurable based on all the inputs that can be put in and provides visibility through some of the external tools. And TFX is the same way. You can, everything's encodified. You can see what's happening. And then it has external tools to see what happens after that model's released. That's repeatable process, because you have the CLI. You can see what's happening. Scalable through the different uh, subsets, like SageMaker, Azure ML, and it's trackable via the UI. And TFX is the same way. Everything's encodified. It has Google Cloud Platform to be deployed, and you can see what's happening through their CUI. Basically, the answer is wine. You know everything that's gone on. All these things are one to predict. You get your answer. So something that these things don't really improve on, need to improve on is capturing benefit from a deployed model. As you saw, once the model's been deployed, they're kind of out on their own. They have external tools to kind of measure that. And then managing the data, uh, DVC was the only one that had a really pipeline to manage data. So those are two things that some of these tools can improve on. Uh, here's the whole TFX pipeline from start to finish. It uses everything from example gens, and it goes all the way to the pusher, because example gen is really the start, so everything can be generated from that. And in 20 lines of code, this is pretty much Encodify the machine learning pipeline in TFX. So pretty much these pipelines really help provide visibility in what's going on. It puts it in a codified manner. Each step is tracked, and you can see where it's going. And to repeat a process, so you can keep doing this over and over and over again. So the repeatable, scalable, and trackable process to avoid those snowflake configurations you wanted to avoid or you've done through these tools. And chaos is a ladder, so I have a pipeline to go through that. Thank you. <laughs>